bucket fill, so to speak, so that we may go share with a lost and dying world. In Jesus' name I pray. Amazing grace. Take my sin, my cross, my 
Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, the sheep are scattered pretty evenly tonight, so it's good to see you all here this evening. What a beautiful day. Uh, have you enjoyed it, either from the inside looking out or outside soaking in the rays? What a beautiful, glorious, glorious day the Lord has given us today. And we are so pleased that uh, you have been able to come and share the sunshine of your life here this evening. What a blessing it is to see each and every one of you. And the Lord is answering prayers and working in people's lives. And uh, people have trouble. Uh, some people have just come through trouble. Uh, other people about to go through trouble. And, and uh, just be good to everybody because you never know what kind of day they've had. Amen and smile at them you never know i know a lady uh that uh one time uh she came out of the beauty shop in the downtown area and there was a man walking down through there whistling a song like amazing grace had his little hat on and and he said well good morning how are you today and she said well, I'm doing better now. How are you? And he said, I'm doing great. And he said, why don't you come to church with us in the morning? It was a Saturday morning. And she says, where at? And he said, Midway Baptist Church, New Tazewell, Tennessee. And his name was uh, Reverend Johnny Knighty. Uh, he didn't have a college education, but he loved the Lord with all of his heart. And uh, he just treated people like that all the time. And... I had the privilege of being that lady's pastor in later years, and, and she told us that story, and she said, you know, my life was just a mess. Her husband was unsaved, and he, she said, I just walked out of the beauty shop, had the weight of the world on my shoulders, and that smile and whistle and good morning turned my life around. And we just never know what you're going to mean to somebody. So I've never forgotten that story, and... Hopefully we can all uh, put on a smile and, and whistle. And if you can't whistle, then uh, tap your toes or something and let your joy uh, be showing. But it's good to see you here tonight. Uh, we, we want to add a couple of names to the prayer list. If you have your copy in front of you, turn it over on the back there from the order of service. And, and Sister Gaynay will ask us, of course, to pray for Jerry, but also to add her sister and brother-in-law, uh, Arville, A-R-V-I-L, Arville and Carolyn Goins, Arville and Carolyn Goins from the uh, Maribel area. So remember them. Brother Arville is undergoing a lot of medical issues right now, and so lift that couple up in your prayers and I know Sister Gaynell would certainly appreciate that. Anybody else need to add a name to the prayer list or just call out a name for us to remember tonight in prayer? Unspoken. Unspoken. Unspoken request. Any others? 
Jim Webb. Okay, let's remember Jim Webb. Anybody else? All right, well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight just to exalt your name, to praise your name, and just to tell you how much we love you, to acknowledge you as the Lord of life, the Savior of the world, uh, the Savior who lives in our hearts if we've been saved. And Lord, we just come to you tonight to, to praise you for your goodness and your mercy and the grace that you gave us salvation when we could never earn it or deserve it. Lord, we come to you tonight and, and thank you, Father, for each person that's here. We thank you for the ones who are watching through one of our <clears throat> through the broadcast tonight that maybe they're not physically able to be here tonight, but we just pray that you speak to them and encourage their hearts. Uh, through the message tonight, through the singing that we've already done, and through this time of prayer. Lord, we lift up to you, uh, Brother Jerry Ferguson, tonight, and we just thank you for the improvement and pray for continued improvement, uh, that, Lord, you just be with him and Gay Nail, and that you would bless uh, Brother Dennis tonight, and uh, we thank you that he's doing better and pray for uh, continued good uh, results, and we pray for uh, Jim Webb tonight. Whatever his need is, we just lift him up to you, Heavenly Father, and uh, we pray for Arville and Carolyn Goins, and pray for their medical issues, and uh, these people that love the Lord, and they're looking to you and trusting you. And Father, we, we pray for all these unspoken requests that have been made here tonight. You know the need of every situation. And Lord, we just pray that God, you would intervene in those situations. And Lord, that you would bring healing where it's needed. That uh, Lord, you would just bring reconciliation where it's needed. That you would just draw hearts. To you in prayer and to the reading of the word and the obedient faith that it takes to follow Christ. And Lord, tonight we, we pray, Heavenly Father, for uh, Lord, those trying to make decisions. We pray that God, that you would just uh, guide every step of their journey and that Lord, you would help them to know what's best for them and their family and Lord, we pray for our church, for uh, the vision that, Lord, you would give us for reaching our community and ministering to the needs of hurting people. And, Heavenly Father, for all of our sister churches, that, God, you would just uh, help us all to be vibrant congregations that would make a difference in bringing light to the darkness. And, and Lord, that we would just love you and love your people and and uh, love the opportunity that you have given us to serve you in the capacity, whether it's as a Sunday school teacher, mission leader, uh, music person, uh, organist, pianist, technician, uh, Lord, just a, a fill-in. Uh, Lord, all of these things are so important. And we just pray, Lord, for them. We pray for our deacons tonight. and. Uh, some of them are here, and we pray for those who are not here and couldn't be here. Uh, we pray, Heavenly Father, for uh, our staff tonight, and thank you for our staff, and just pray for your continued leadership. And Lord, just speak to us through your word tonight. Encourage our hearts. Uh, lift us up. Show us the way that you have for us to go. And may we obey the word that we hear from you to our hearts. In Jesus' name, we thank you for answering these prayers just as if you'd already done so, for we know you will. Amen. Amen. Would you turn with me to Mark's Gospel, chapter number 14? You get a surprise tonight. Uh, have you ever heard about getting a surprise because a bonus surprise because you went the extra mile? Well, I don't know if it's the extra mile, but uh, you're, you or somewhere others aren't tonight. You're in 
our uh, worship on Wednesday service. And so you're getting a bonus. Uh, you ever, uh, ever get a DVD or something? So for those of you who remember what a DVD is, and I understand that's outdated almost anymore. And I don't know what's updated, Brother Charles, but a DVD, sometimes you get bonus scenes like a movie, and they show bonus scenes of the making and different scenes that they didn't have in the movie. And, and so you get a bonus. And so that's what you're going to get tonight uh, for being here on a Wednesday night, okay? Because we're going to talk some more about uh, celebration, countdown, countdown to celebration. Uh, and I've picked what I believe the Lord would have me do on Sunday mornings, but there's also some some celebration moments leading up to the celebration of Easter that I want to share on Wednesday nights. And, and tonight I want us, as we think about the denial uh, and we think about the betrayal, the betrayal Sunday morning and the denial we talked about Sunday night, we're going to back up in time just a little bit. I've struggled with, I like to keep things as chronological as possible, uh, but I, you know what? Uh, I just felt like that, that we needed that, that uh, denial sermon for Sunday night. And so we're going to back up just a little bit. Between uh, the uh, arrest of Jesus following the institution of the Lord's Supper and, uh, and his arrest in, in the garden is what we're going to look at tonight, okay? We're going to look at the arrest in the garden. And that's going to come in verse 32 and following through verse 36. And so uh, between the institution of the Lord's Supper and when he was arrested there in the garden, something happened in the garden. And I want us to think about as we count down to celebrating Easter of what happened there. It's an exciting time to be a Christian uh, this time of year. It's an exciting time to be a member at First Baptist Church and uh, be a part of the city of Oneida and, and Scott County, McCreary County, uh, Kentucky, and wherever you happen to live. Uh, it's an exciting time to be alive and to be a Christian, a believer, a follower of Jesus, because we're celebrating the most important event in all of Christianity, that first Easter Sunday morning when he raised from the dead. But tonight I want us to look at, at the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, we talked about the betrayal. We talked about the denial. We're backing up tonight talking about the garden. And then a little sneak preview. If you want to be studying, we're going to be talking about the trial on Sunday. And we're going to be talking about the crucifixion on Sunday. Okay? And so you, you just stay with us as we get ready for Easter. But tonight in Mark's Gospel, chapter 14 again... And verse 32, the very first few words of verse 32, uh, do you feel like standing to honor the reading of the word tonight just to stretch a minute and honor the word of God? If you feel like it, stand. If you don't, uh, just you will honor the word as we read it together. In verse number 32, it says, And they came to a place named Gethsemane. Would you pray with me? Father, we come to you tonight, and again, we thank you for the opportunity to be here. It's always a great honor and joy to open up your word and to talk about your word and to try to teach and preach your word. And Father, I just pray that you would speak to us tonight in this, this uh, brief homily, uh, a message of encouragement, a message of hope, a message of endurance and perseverance, because as we see uh, the agony that Jesus went through there in the garden. Uh, maybe it will help somebody uh, as they go through an agonizing time in their own life, maybe even in, in following Jesus and doing what they believe that he is leading them to do. So, Lord, let us see his example. Let us understand his heart and the great love wherein and wherewith he loved us that he was willing to endure the garden. Help us not to skip over that part and just uh, beat up on Judas Iscariot for betraying him and beat up on Peter for denying him. And help us see that between those two events, 
that there was another event that was all about us, those of us living today and all of those individuals who have lived in between that event and now. So, Lord, help us to see ourselves in this story. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. There is probably no more sacred scene in the Bible than the scene that took place in the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, some of you may have been blessed, as I was upon one occasion, to travel uh, to Jerusalem, and the uh, tour took us to a place that they uh, think, based upon where the uh, gates of the city were, and as best they know them in today's uh, time, and where that the Garden of Gethsemane was, and and so uh, a very, very uh, uh, inspiring place to be when you think about the context of what took place there. Jesus takes the disciples uh, from the upper room out into the Mount of Olives across the Kidron Brook, which is red with the blood of slain sacrificial animals. And they entered the garden at Gethsemane, and we get the very first glimpse of what Jesus went through to pay the price for our sins. Uh, this garden says so much to us. When you think about what took place there, a lot of times the, we, don't, we just don't really, really uh, see that happening. Uh, we skip over that. Uh, I'm reminded of, of uh, a drama that that we did in our uh, one of our previous churches, and uh, did it on a pretty regular basis during the Easter season. And one of the big scenes was the Garden of Gethsemane, and it just really that dramatic uh, presentation of that. It just really drove home the fact of what Gethsemane really was all about. That we can see for the very first time how much that Jesus loves us and how much that he's willing to endure uh, to pay the price for our sins. And so what it also says to us is that we need to learn the secret of surrender to God, uh, surrendering our will to the will of God. And that's what the Son of God, Jesus, did. When you think of Gethsemane, there's some things I'd like to get you to uh, etch in your mind, in your memory about Gethsemane. There's, there's about three major things with some things that we'll talk about in the middle of that. But in verse 32, the rest of verse 32, and then also in verse 35, if you'll be thinking about that, uh, we want to talk about and remember that Gethsemane was a physical place, and we want to remember that the uh, prayer took place in the Garden of Gethsemane. So we want to think about the physical place and prayer that took place in the Garden of Gethsemane. As far as the place, it's the word uh, Gethsemane is a transliteration of two Hebrew words that means oil press. And so many, many scholars feel like, and evidently, that there was an olive grove uh, there uh, at the time, or there had been one there. And so Gethsemane oil press, and it was a place that uh, the olive press would have been there to get the olive oil from. And so Gethsemane, uh, quite literally just meaning oil press. So the exact location really can't be known, but it certainly was on the lower slopes of the western side of the Mount of Olives, and it was across the Kidron Valley, we know that. Uh, it's mentioned here, and I think in, in Matthew, and, and it was opposite of the temple area. And so it, it's, yes, mentioned here in, in Matthew's account of the, of the uh, Easter story. Uh, but Mark says in verse 14, or chapter 14, verse 35, he says, going a little farther, going a little farther, look what he did. He fell, Jesus fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. And so uh, uh, 
uh, Jews most often prayed standing and with uplifted uh, hands like this or like this. And so for someone who was a Jew uh, like Jesus was to fall prostrate upon the ground uh, would have been a matter of extreme urgency. You probably had the same experience yourself. You probably prayed in a, a seated posture or uh, perhaps uh, on your knees beside your bed or beside your chair in the living room or you bow your head at the table giving uh, thanks for the bountiful food uh, supply that's on the table and God's blessings upon your life. And then you probably also prayed when your heart was broken. And when your heart's broken, a lot of times, Brother Jimmy, I know I, I just, I'll just lay down or put my face against the floor and, and just get as low, the idea is as low as you can get, uh, showing humility because you're feeling that humility. You're feeling that brokenness. Uh, Dr. Adrian Rogers tells the story uh, one time about... Uh, a decision to to surrender to God's call upon his life for ministry and and he talks about going out on on the football field and something that he loved very much and and he talks about uh, falling down just prostrate upon the ground and getting his face uh, just in the grass of that football field and and he says as it were he, he said I just said Lord I just want to be as low as I can and he said I took my hands and even kept out the grass and the dirt and just put my nostrils down and said Lord I want to be just as low I'm as humble as I know how to to be Lord I need your help and you've probably gone through some things in life that it wasn't a setting up time for prayer it wasn't uh, just bowing beside the chair time for prayer it's a time to put your whole face or body uh, on the floor in humility and brokenness and pray to God and so uh, it was an extreme urgency on the heart of Jesus. He prayed that if it was the Father's will that the hour might pass from him. That is the hour that God had set for the accomplishment of his purpose. The hour of Jesus' arrest. The hour of Jesus' trial. The, the hour of Jesus' execution. And we've already talked about what Peter did during the time of his arrest and, and uh, while he was on trial, but we're going to talk about the trial and the execution on Sunday. But there we find as, as Jesus, this real purpose of God coming to pass, Lord, if it could, this hour could pass from me, it's an expression of his real humanity. Uh, Brother John Watson, a lot of people have struggled. Uh, separating Jesus as God and Jesus as man. And the Bible says he was fully God. He was the Son of God. But the Bible also says he was fully man, born of a woman, and that he suffered on the cross, that he had emotions and feelings just like you and I do, that he was even able to be tempted just like we are. He was a man. You say, how can that be? I don't know. I don't understand. I do know that's what the Bible says. And that's good enough for me. But he was fully man. And so uh, Jesus was there. And he expressed his real humanity to God the Father in prayer. And said, Father, if it's your will, let this cup pass from me. And so when you think of Gethsemane, you'll want to remember the physical place and the very real urgent prayer and the physical way that Jesus prayed there with that urgency. Uh, so remember the physical place of the garden and the physical way that Jesus prayed. And also you'll want to remember a second thing about the Garden of Gethsemane as we prepare for our time of celebration through our music programs and through Easter Sunday morning and now we know we're going to have a baptismal service as part of that celebration service on Sunday morning, and so it's going to be a wonderful day. But we also want to remember the personal agony of Jesus in the garden. So we, we remember that there's a physical place called Gethsemane, 
and there was an urgent way that Jesus prayed there, but also part of that urgency displayed itself or made itself known as the personal agony of Jesus. Uh, he, he was agonizing in prayer. Uh, look with me at verses 33 and 34. The Bible says that, that he took Peter, James, and John, that inner circle of disciples, Peter, James, and John, uh, he took them along with him. And he began to be, look, look how your translation says, he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. Deeply distressed and troubled. And uh, the New American Standard says, and he took with him Peter, James, and John and began to be very distressed and troubled. Very, very similar. And then he says in verse 34, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. He said to them, stay here. Stay here and watch. Keep a lookout. Watch. Watch and pray with me. Jesus was in agony in Gethsemane. Uh, Dr. James Brooks states that Mark's description of Jesus here is completely shocking. He uses words that depict the strongest possible anguish in a human being's life. He was in physical agony, physical agony, that he exchanged the uh, drops of perspiration for drops of blood as he agonized in prayer. He was in mental agony, and he was also in spiritual agony because he was praying. He, wanted to, he knew the Father's plan uh, as, as Jesus, the Son of God, and he was in complete compliance, and he was on board. He, he signed up for the program. He was very God, Paul said. But he also, he was the God-man. And so he was in physical agony, mental agony, and even spiritual agony. Mark indicated that Jesus did not die with this stoic apathy as though death were of no consequence. It wasn't that he could just go through this in a way that you and I could never experience. Because we say, oh, well, he was God. That was no big deal. That's not true. It was a big deal. He was the God-man. And so he looked at death as something of consequence. And he really hurt. He agonized. He was in pain. He suffered there in the garden as he approached the cross. So his admonition to the inner circle of disciples uh, to be spiritually alert because he was hurting. He was agonizing, and he said, be spiritually alert. Pray with me. Watch with me. So when you think of Gethsemane, you'll want to remember the physical place of the garden and the physical way that Jesus prayed there with urgency. But you'll also want to remember the personal agony of Jesus in the garden and see there how much that he loved us that he was willing to agonize there in the garden that first glimpse of his great love for us in the garden of Gethsemane and then finally this evening uh, when you think of Gethsemane you will remember a final thing that we certainly don't want to forget I want us to remember the victory that Jesus won through prayer in Gethsemane because you may be agonizing right now you may be in the throes of despair right now you may be wanting to say to God and we've all been there God let this pass from me if it could be your will but Jesus won a battle there that he will help us win so remember the victory that Jesus won through prayer in Gethsemane. Look at verse 36. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Yet, not what I will, but what you will. He won the victory by completely surrendering at his will. So Jesus won the victory. What he did, he renounced his personal will there in the garden. Uh, some very personal things in life have happened to all of us. They've certainly happened uh, in mine and Debbie's life. And 
where we just had to pray, Lord, we know what we want. And Robbie, to start with, you just keep going back. Lord, this is what I want. I'm asking you for this, Lord. But finally, when victory comes is when you get to the place, even as painful and hurt and weeping as it might be, that you are willing to say to God, but not our will, but yours be done. And I know that you will be faithful and that you will see us through whatever happens. And you may be there now, you may have been there, or you may be there in the future, we all may be, but Jesus renounced his personal will there in the garden and he prayed for some other way if possible some other way other than the awful agony of the cross. So Jesus won the victory of renouncing his personal will in the garden, but also Jesus won the victory of resigning himself to God's will in the garden. Just a little bit of difference there. So not my will, but here's, here's the clincher, but thy will be done. So he resigned himself to God's will in the garden. He did nothing less than express his full surrender and full commitment to doing the will of his Father, no matter what the cost was to him. Have you ever prayed that prayer? Have you ever just said, Lord, I'll give up my will. That's not enough. We know what our agenda is, don't we? We know what we want, but that's not enough. We've got to go that extra mile, as it were, and say, Lord, but your will be done. No matter what the personal cost is to me and to those I love, your will be done in my life. And when you get to that place, it's one thing to say, Lord, I'm willing to cancel my agenda. Maybe I had the wrong agenda. Maybe I, I just need to give up some, some of those dreams and aspirations that I had for me or my spouse or my family or my kids or grandkids. Maybe it's enough just to give that up, Lord, but no, it's really not. What it boils down to is after that step, Wilma, of renouncing your own will, you have to completely resign yourself to God's will. You, you go to the Old Testament. There's so many examples. You go to the Old Testament book of Jonah. And, you know, it would have been enough for, for Jonah in his mind, I'm sure, just said, okay, now, uh, I'm okay. I, I'm, I'm not going to be uh, what I had planned to be in life. I'm, okay, I'm giving up my agenda. I'm giving up my plans, but, you know, he had to go a little further. He, he had a hated enemy, the Ninevites, political enemies. Boy, this would be a good message to preach on the Capitol steps, wouldn't it, in Washington, D.C., political enemies. And it's not enough just to say, okay, I'm going to give up my agenda, but to say to the Father, I accept your agenda. For my life, no matter what it cost me. So his prayer to be spared death was answered in accordance with the divine will of God. And God gave him something far better than to escape death. Think about it. You know what God gave him that was far better than escaping death? He gave him victory over death. And he gave it to all of us because Jesus endured that agonizing time of resigning his own will and resigning himself to God's will in the garden. He went through death, yes, but God gave him something better than escaping death, and that was victory over death. The same would be true for future martyrs as Stephen died as a martyr. He said, I see Jesus <laughs> standing at the Father's right hand. Something far better than escaping death, victory over death. 
and first death and then resurrection was the will of God see Jesus the man said now father if it's your will let, let me not have to drink from this cup death but God said I've got something far better you know God's always got something far better for us far better it may be painful getting there, but he's got something far better for us. And if Jesus' will had been done instead of the Father's will, he would have never had the victorious resurrection from the dead, victory over death. And we would all still have been held captive in death's grip. But thanks be unto God. God had something far better. First death and then resurrection. That was the will of God. And the most important thing for which Jesus prayed in Gethsemane was for the Father's will to be done. Dennis Corrigan wrote in Christianity Today, and he said, Gethsemane teaches us that the kingdom of God is entered only through the denial of one's own will and the affirmation of the will of God. Therefore, the cross must stand central to an understanding of the kingdom of God. And since the essence of the kingdom is our obedience to the absolute will of God, we understand it only as we bring our own will to the foot of the cross. No self-will can live unchallenged in God's kingdom. Now, I'm going to repeat his last line of that little short paragraph he wrote. No self-will can live unchallenged in God's kingdom. We are not a people of our own will. We are a people that would completely bring our will to the foot of the cross. So when I would close tonight speaking to those here and those uh, just going off the air in a moment, have you had a Gethsemane? Have you had a time that you prayed to the Father and resigned your own will and resigned yourself to the will of the Heavenly Father? If so, you had victory in Gethsemane. And if you haven't, you will have a Gethsemane. And if you pray the way Jesus prayed, you can have victory in your Gethsemane as well. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight to thank you for the faithfulness of your Son. Thank you that he loved us so much at this first glimpse in Gethsemane, after the memorial supper, after Judas had, had, had dipped the bread with Jesus, after Jesus looked at him, and Judas ran out to betray him for 30 pieces of silver. Lord, thank you that we have a glimpse into Jesus' love for us, that he went out into the garden, and he renounced his self-will to escape death and resigned himself to your will, Heavenly Father, first death then resurrection from the dead because were it not for that we would have no hope we would be of all men most miserable but thanks be unto God for Jesus in the garden first death and by the time we get to April 21st then resurrection in Jesus' name we pray and give thanks. Amen. Amen. Anybody with a testimony or a word? Amen, Jimmy. I know you do, brother. Anybody else? Go in peace. Thank you for being here. Bring you next time. I'll see if I can do the same. <laughs>